Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger. On this episode, we're talking about how to take control of your financial life and maybe help you retire earlier than you would ever think. Money is something that there's so much fear, so much emotion. People think it's so complicated. I truly believe that anything in life, money is the pathway to freedom. Money gives you time and space, but money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. Today, we are talking about that FIRE movement. Remember, not the FIRE thing, the festival. FIRE, financial independence, retire early. We've got one of the leaders of the movement, Grant Sabatier. He's just written a book called Financial Freedom, A Proven Path to All the Money You Will Ever Need. His story is amazing. The interview was wonderful. And hey, it's official. My book is out. The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. 13 Ways to Right Your Financial Wrongs. You can get it anywhere you want, any place you buy your books. The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money on sale now. Here's our interview with Grant Sabatier. You're listening to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. Grant, welcome to the program. How are you? I'm great. Glad to be here. Uh, So we start with uh, a very easy question for someone like you, which is, what is the best financial decision you've ever made? The best financial decision I ever made is to order one book. I Googled best money books, and the first book that came up was Your Money or Your Life by Vicki Robin, and the book completely changed my life. Vicki is now a co-creator with me, a good friend. We're working on some projects together. And just that one book completely transformed my life. Okay. Before we get into the transformation, let's talk about the life. So talk about kind of your upbringing and your relationship to money prior to Googling that book and buying it. Sure. Um, So my parents, let me start there really quickly. They grew up in rural Indiana, like one stoplight town, um, had nothing growing up, were very poor, like one pair of pants per year type poor. Um, And then they ended up having me after not thinking they could have kids. They got uh, pregnant in their late 20s and decided that they wanted to give me a different opportunity. And so they moved from rural Indiana, left all of their families, the only people who've ever done this, and they moved to the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And my mom was a secretary for a number of years, and my dad actually cleaned office buildings. Uh, And so they really kind of started from the bottom. And I was always in my class, the kid with the least amount of money. I never felt deprived. I always felt like I had opportunities. I knew my parents were making a lot of sacrifices for me, but I could tell that being outside the D.C. suburbs, there's quite a bit of money that I you know, always had the least amount on my soccer team. Money was something that stressed my parents out. Mm-hmm. They talked about it. You know, it was something that was always very present. And my father used to tell me two things when I was a kid. These are some of my earliest memories. Life is a beach and money is freedom. And I didn't know as like a five-year-old kid what either of those meant. And I actually had the opportunity last year when I launched my Financial Freedom podcast to bring my dad on as the first guest. And I asked him, I said, what did you mean by money is freedom? And so he got to unpack, you know, how he always viewed uh, money and was diligent about saving, even though he didn't make a lot. And so it's it's not lost on me or anyone that I, you know, had such a kind of um, intimate relationship with money from a young age. And it's always something that I've been fascinated by. And uh, now I feel grateful that I, you know, am able to do this. Did you feel stress when you were young about money? Uh, I didn't feel stress, but I felt my parents stress. Mm. Certainly. I was an only child. You know, we were kind of the three of us. We were a unit. And so I knew it was something that stressed them out. Uh, Everything from I remember one year they had a hard time uh, making the payment for my soccer team. You know, I remember that very vividly. And so it was always something. But on the flip side, I knew that they were giving me opportunities. So that was always kind of embedded in me. And then when you fast forward and I had to move back home at 24, I felt quite a bit of shame around they'd given me so much opportunity and made so many sacrifices for me. And my parents are in their mid 60s now and they're still both working. Uh, You know, they didn't start saving for retirement until they were in their 50s. Mm. Um, And, you know, they've done incredibly well uh, with what they had. And I'm extremely proud of them. But certainly money was something that was was very stressful uh, in our house. So you grew up outside of D.C. in the suburbs and then you went to college. Yep. And where did that take you? Yeah, so I was kind of the kid who did everything he was supposed to do. Um, 
you know, worked hard, curious, graduated number two in my class. I ended up going to the University of Chicago. I really wanted to get a job uh, by the time I graduated college, and I got one at a company two hours outside of Chicago in one of the northern suburbs that you know when you call into airlines or any company, and it's like, this call may be monitored for quality assurance. I worked for the company that listened to those calls. Oh, boy. And so that's what I did. Like It's, it's sort of like some dystopian uh, situation where I was commuting, waking up at, at four every day. Um, so it was the job that I got. I was excited. I was making $42,000. But I ended up bouncing around four different jobs over about a three-year period because mm. I never quite found the right fit. I mean, that commute really killed me. I ended up getting laid off seven months later because I wasn't going through enough calls. And so thus, I wasn't making the company enough money. And then I went to another somewhat related company and I couldn't kind of find my fit. I really wanted to be a writer. That's what I really wanted to do. So I was writing fiction. I was, uh, you know, trying to do that on the side, but the work ended up being so sort of soul crushing that I didn't have enough space to do that. How many years did you bounce around like that? It's like two and a half, almost three years. At that point, did you say, I got to move like I got to move home or because because financial reality or because you just want to I mean, sometimes you just want to nest. You want to like, I want to regroup and there's nothing wrong with that. So what was the motivation for you to go back home? I just completely ran out of money. I got down. That's a good motivation. Yeah, to $400 and I wasn't going to be able to pay my rent. And my girlfriend is now my wife. You know, she was like, had roommates and so I couldn't really crash there. And, you know, it became a situation where she was a little like, what are you doing with your life? She was in graduate school at the time. And so I moved back to my parents, had a reset. They said that I could stay there for three months. Which I think is amazing. In the book I read that and I was like, like, I thought that was an interesting thing that it really they're like, OK, the clock is ticking. Here we go. And you're going to contribute also to this household. Right. Yeah. And my father actually said it was one of the toughest things that he had to do as a parent being like, we're not going to give you any money. You know, I probably would have like blasted out of there, you know, anyway, as quickly as I could, because I just f- had so much emotion around it. And I didn't want to be 24 living back with my parents. But, you know, they made sure, obviously, putting that bookend that, hey, you know, you got to take this seriously, you got to get out. And they didn't really ask me much how things were going during the period. So they didn't I, nag you? No, they didn't nag me. But like, you, you know, we come down, I felt like a child, like sitting down at dinner, you know, we'd sit around and we'd be talking about something else. But you could tell, you know, when you're talking to someone, and then look in their face, they're thinking about four other things. Yeah. Say, well, here's the, your your mother's like. Um, uh, I want to ask him how many job interviews he talked oh, totally. about, right? I, yeah, but totally. I don't want to say that because that's going to make him go off, right? right? And just worry, just general worry in their eyes, just kind of like concern of like, is he okay? You know, what's he going to do? Oh. Um, so I felt all of that, and also I knew how much my parents had sacrificed for me, and so I had that kind of double whammy where it's like, okay, you know, always kind of doing well by them was important to me. It's like you're the good boy and you've got that great guilt that's firing you up. Totally. And also, as you said, you know, you're hyper focused mm-hmm. on projects. So explain what happened after the Vicky Robin moment. What was going on in your head and your heart when you got through that book? So the big takeaway that you're trading your life energy for money was just a huge wake up call for me. I was like, okay, I can always kind of go out and make more money, but I'm 24. I'm never going to get back the time in my life. I'm in the prime of my life. And my takeaway from the book was actually different than Vicky intended. And she's always like, you know, kind of getting on me for this because my takeaway was like, okay, if I'm trading my time for money, I need to make as much money as possible (laughs) for my time. And she actually wrote the book to help activists and socially conscious people get enough money so then they could do the good work of changing the world. And here I come along and I'm just like, now I'm on that path. But I was just like, okay, I need to make as much money as possible. Mm. So I looked at my skill set and I'd applied to over 200 jobs. 200? 200 and hadn't oh gotten a call back. God. I actually looked, when I was writing the book, I went back and looked at my email account and I looked at some of the jobs that I had applied to because I still had the resumes in there. And one of the jobs was to be an apprentice at a florist in Chicago. And now I think I'm like, if I had gotten <laughs> that job, you know, I mean, that is how like wide I was going. If I had gotten that job, maybe I'd be a florist. Today. Well, maybe, be, be maybe you'd be really happy. Who knows? Who but, knows? You know, yeah. but two, so you went 0 for 200, essentially? 0 for, 0 for 200. So I was like, okay, I need a new skill set. I need okay. to figure something out. And so I just was doing a simple Google search on my phone and I saw a Google mobile ad and they were pretty new at the time. This is 2010. And I was like, oh, what's this? I hadn't seen a Google ad on my phone. So then I just Googled Google mobile ad. And the first thing that came up was an article from eMarketer that was like Google campaign 
pain management jobs are going to grow 300 percent by 2020. I was like, oh, wow, there's demand for people to do this. What is this? Second result, Google AdWords University, which is basically I watched a two minute video on how Google advertising works. And it's actually really fascinating because it's really competitive. It's a real time auction bidding system. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. And then next to it, it was like, do you want a job running Google campaigns? Get Google AdWords certified for free. And so you could take a test that Google administered for free. And if you got certification, you know, you could put it on your resume. Mm. And so I looked at it briefly and I was like, oh, wow, this will take me about an hour to do. And they had all the free tutorials and all the videos. So I spent the next 30 days watching every single video in the AdWords University and also watching additional videos on YouTube, completely over prepared for the test. I mean, I probably could have taken it after the first week. I got certified. Then I just Googled Google ad campaign manager job Chicago because I wanted to get back to Chicago. Because the girlfriend, girlfriend was there. Exactly. I applied to three jobs, but the first one that I applied to, I ended up getting about a week and a half later. Oh, my God. And this is that awesome. And that was it. And then I was making $50,000 working for a 25-person digital marketing agency, actually running Google AdWords campaigns for the largest Cubs, uh, Chicago Cubs merchandiser uh, in the country. And so I was like becoming a master at that. And that next year uh, when I worked at this agency, it was like getting a PhD in digital marketing because wow. I spent time with all the people in the company and just really soaked it up. To come out of the experience you just had and actually love what you did, yeah. that is pretty fortunate. Love. I think love and like are different. I okay. think I liked it. All right, liked I think it. what I thought was coolest was that you can get 20% of media spend to run Google campaigns. So I actually figured that I could probably make more money faster doing this than even being like a financial advisor. If I could get someone to spend a million dollars, I would get $200,000 of it. Right. And I'd set the goal when I was at my parents to save a million dollars and retire as quickly as possible. I didn't know what that meant, but a million dollars was like my goal. And so once I saw that, I was like, okay, I only need to sell five million dollars worth of media spend and I'll have made a million dollars at least in fees. And so I looked at it in those types of chunks. And so I was off to the races. And It's a highly profitable uh, business. And so I was really attracted by that as well. When you thought to yourself a million dollars financial independence. Mm -hmm. Did you really know what, what that meant? Or was it just like, I want a million dollars? Because it's a good round number. Yeah, it was that simple. I okay. mean, it was just like, I'm, I want to save a million dollars and I'm going to figure this. I'm going to see, I'm going to try to get there as quickly as possible. I also had already, through your money or your life, bought into the idea of how much is enough. And so going into my first job, immediately even making $50,000, I was saving 60% of my income. How was that possible? Because you're shacking up with a girlfriend at that time? I shacked up with a girlfriend, and then I ended up upsetting a roommate, so I got kicked out of that apartment. So I had to get my own apartment. <laughs> so I got an $800 a month apartment in Chicago that was really kind of crappy in a bad neighborhood. I needed a car, uh, and so I got an $800 Nissan Maxima. And I just, I was working all the time, so I wasn't, I literally spent no money. I was either like working or reading about money because I knew, I figured out that I could actually accelerate the rate of compounding. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge moment for me. So I didn't know like kind of where I was going. The million dollars is what I wanted to save. I knew I was, I was was, you know, saving a high percentage of my income. But then I did the math and I was like, even saving 60% of my $50,000 income, it's going to take me maybe 22 years to get there. So I need to make more money. And so, so, then, and so how did you make more money? Oh, yeah. So this is the fun part. So <laughs> three months in, I'd learned enough about digital marketing. I'd learned how to build my first website. I was building WordPress websites, which now are really easy. You can do it with one click. It was easy back then, but you still had to do it. And so I went on Craigslist and I literally just searched in the classified ad uh, section and there was a lawyer who was looking for a website. Lawyer needs a website and he had a $500 budget. Reached out to him. I was like, I'll do it. And so I basically got paid to learn how to build a website. So I used a template that I bought for $49. I customized it. I delivered the website to him. He was super happy. And I was like, hey, do you have anyone else that you know that needs websites? And he goes, I might. So through a, a, the next three months, he introduced me to some of his friends and I got hooked into a local association of realtors in Chicago. And at the end of that next three months, so I'd been six months since I learned digital marketing, I sold my first $50,000 website. Oh, that's awesome. And so I'd made more money in this one. And it's so funny because I sold the project and basically I told him it would take at least, you know, a month and a half to deliver, maybe a month, month and a half. And I finished it in four days. And so I actually had to wait two and a half weeks. And I didn't want to make it sound so, so, oh, so to easy. Totally. But that was like, a lot of people were like, how'd you go from $500 to $50,000? I was like, I had nothing to lose. And then I started to unpack really what motivates people to buy and the perception of value and you know I was I'm like a I really try to figure out how people think and I realized that the woman who was buying the website for me the head of marketing for this law firm 
she wanted a nice website, but that was table stakes. What she really wanted was to look good to her partners. Right. And so I focused on selling her on the idea that, hey, once a week, I'm going to send you an email that you can send to your boss. Right. You know, and here's I'm going to help here's, you. Right here. And like, I'm going to give you the metrics to deliver Abs- to them. Absolutely. Right? Oh, and then fabulous. I, I ended up building my whole career on that where I focused on it doesn't matter how hard you work in life and everything that happens behind the door. What matters is the perception of the value of what you're selling to the person you're selling it to. And so I really fell in love with that and sales strategy and storytelling. And by the end of that first year, I was making $50,000 as my salary but I'd made over $300,000 running Google AdWords campaigns for realtors, uh, for a dentist office. You know, I was had my hands in a lot of different things. And And at this time, your girlfriend's in grad school, right? She's in grad school. Yeah. And so she's working hard. She's working so hard. You go work fine. I got things to do. Right. Right. Okay. So that wasn't it wasn't like because some people would be like maybe have stress in your relationship if you're Mm -hmm. so plunged in. But if you're both killing yourselves and working really hard, it's kind of like great timing. Let's do it now while we're young and we've got energy, right? Yeah, it's perfect. And so uh, she works in academia and she was actually doing a lot of her research overseas for two of the five years that I became financially independent. And that was actually really helpful because it's like you're checking in with your partner once a week or a couple of times a week on Skype and then you can just focus on. I mean, that's why this is so much easier to become financially independent for someone in their 20s doesn't mean that you can't do it or shouldn't you know pursue it in your 30s and 40s but um, I went all in and I made trade-offs that I wouldn't make again and I also in writing the book realized that um, I didn't even need millions of dollars or to be financially independent I already had so many of the benefits of what I was looking for early on I just was so driven to get there and one of the things is you don't need millions of dollars to feel free and that's, that's a great point. I mean, I just interviewed this woman who wrote a really interesting book about the state of employment right now, mm-hmm. right? It's called The Job. And one of the things that she talked about was that millennials especially ha- are just so have so much anxiety around mm-hmm. their work life. Sure. And it's and obviously if you're feeling anxiety, you don't perform at your peak, right? Right. But they she also said that one of the things that people crave is consistency. Mm-hmm. And another thing they crave is to have some semblance of control. It sounds to me like you are more interested in the control factor, that you'll kill yourself working. You don't need it to be someone sending you a half a million dollar paycheck every year. Right. But that you could be in control seems to be a big motivator for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, We all have the illusion of control. I mean, the paradox is the most beautiful things in life tend to be those things that are actually unexpected. And so even though we try to organize all areas and control everything in our life, it's often those unexpected things. And so it took me becoming financially independent to learn some of these deeper, I'd say, life lessons um, that I was just so hyper-focused. I actually talk a lot about burnout in the book. Um, You know, I feel like Especially for millennials, I just turned 34. I'm on the older end of millennials. You seem like old, you're right. The, I feel like the experience uh, that I have a couple years later, then it catches up with the rest of the generation. Mm-hmm. And so it's pretty interesting. Like, I am the digital native. I got a used laptop when I was seven years old. I mean, I've been, I'm most comfortable in my life at my computer keyboard, literally. And that's one of the things that um, I think now we're reaching a point where money as a pathway to freedom, you don't need millions of dollars. Just having six months of expenses or a year of expenses gives you so many more options. Uh, And I knew that, but I was just, you know, really on this path to escape when now looking back, it's like I would have done a much more balanced job, I think, of along the way. I I, I, honestly, I lost my, you know, half of my 20s on this. And I feel grateful that now I have the ability to, uh, you know, do what I want with my life. And I think the sacrifice was more of an opportunity. It was worth it. But, you know, I didn't go to the concerts with my friends that now I kind of wish I would have. I didn't. One of the things you don't realize when you're in your 20s is that, A, I had so much energy then and I took advantage of it. But you don't realize how much you're going to grow and change, Mm -hmm. you know, as a person. And so I was like, oh, I'll always have that opportunity. And now the friends that I could have gone to, you know, Coachella with or, you know, Bonnaroo, all these festivals and travel to Europe with. One of my good friends in the middle of this wanted me to go on this trip for two months to Europe. I didn't go with him. And now you realize, okay, now all my friends have families and now they're not in that same headspace. You kind of think you're always going to have these opportunities. And so that's one of the reasons why I think a a more balanced approach. I'm by far kind of on the extreme end, but I feel like an explorer. 
Like I've gone to the edge of money, literally the edge of money. I've unpacked this human invention. I've looked at it from every angle. I've read all the books. I've talked to thousands of people, written you know over 700,000 words about it now. And now I've been to the edge and I've come kind of back from the edge. And this is my report. And so from your report in Financial Freedom, a proven path to all the money you will ever need, who are you writing this for? I'm writing it for everyone. Um, you know, I started writing it for my 24-year-old self. And then um, since I started Millennial Money in 2015, I've had over 17,000 reader emails of people. I got one this morning that just b- literally brought me to tears. And these are people, there's so many people out there struggling with money in their life. And money is something that uh, there's so much fear, so much emotion. People think it's so complicated. And I, you know, it's why I dedicated the book to anyone who's stressed about money and wants more from life. Like, I hear you. Like, I'm writing it for people who feel stuck in their life and, and, and are looking for that breath of air. Because I truly believe that money, anything in life, money is the pathway to freedom. Money gives you time and space. But money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. And so changing your relationship with money and, and ev- this is going against, and I feel this way even now in talking about the book, Everything, almost everything that the money world and the personal finance world has told you your entire life. And I feel like I'm walking up a rapid filled river with this message because um, this is not a great message for the banks. This is not a great, this is a message of empowerment and financial literacy as a human right. This is, here's a guy whose parents had nothing, who gave him an opportunity, who's never taken a finance class or worked with a banker who found a path out and there's a door now there's a window and the path is getting wider and more and more people are going down this path and they're starting to live life on their own terms and when you live life on your own terms it's it goes counter to this sort of narrative uh the 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 common success narrative of you always have to chase the next dollar the job promotion and one of the things i looked out at the world and saw my parents burnt out and everyone burnt out and no one being able to retire and i was like clearly what's been shared in the mainstream isn't working and is no, maybe it did work, but it's no longer working. And so instead of making a right turn, I decided to make a left and I meet resistance at every level. In in what way? So, so, so tell me the kind of resistance that you get. Yeah. So uh, you don't get love. Like I hugged you when you walked. Oh, I get love. I get a lot of (laughs) love. But from the people like me, like old farts, like I think what you're doing is amazing. It really is. And I think that I think that the I guess what you just said that really hit me is that you want to basically empower somebody, but you don't say that being rich is empowerment. You say like your knowledge, your ability to make a difference. It doesn't mean, you know, sometimes when I I come off the air, uh, you know, someone will say to me, but like, I just can't put away fifty dollars a week. Like I really can't Mm -hmm. afford it. And I'm like, well, what do you think you can afford? Mm -hmm. But just tell me what you think. Well, I could do 10. All right, great. Do 10. Right. Like do something so you feel like you're controlling mm-hmm. some piece of your financial life. So what is the pushback that you get? I mean, the message is so perfect. I yeah. don't get what like who would push back against it. I think people who are afraid of truly going inside and questioning their life. Mm. I think it's so easy in life to chase that next thing. It makes us feel good. It's always easier to kind of like close our eyes and try to get the next job promotion or the next dollar amount. The tougher work is to stop and actually unpack what does make you happy. What do you actually want in life? Because the most important question isn't how much money do you need. The most important question is what kind of life do you want to live? And then how much money do you need to live that life? And a lot of people don't know what makes them happy. And they don't know their why or their purpose. And we live in a culture now that's like, be happy, be happy, be happy, be happy. But happiness shouldn't be the goal. To be fully alive should be the goal. Right. I mean, your life is not peaches and cream. Right. Life is hard. Right. And there are hard things. You went through a really hard time in your life. Totally. And your parents have had hard times in their life. But that is life. It's not like you cannot be, it's like, choose to be happy. Like, I always thought that was such BS. Like, right. bad crap happens. Like, I'm not going to be happy about that. Right. Right. The whole idea, I realized through this whole process that it re- what I was chasing, it wasn't about the money at all. I was looking for peace. Mm-hmm. And it comes back to this idea. I felt like I needed a lot more money than in reality I probably did to feel at peace. And so a lot of people in their life that I talk to, so many people, they don't have enough money saved and they feel stuck. Mm -hmm. They've built debt, responsibilities, and they feel stuck in their life. And when you're stuck in life, it's incredibly hard to get perspective on your life. And so money, the whole idea of the seven levels of financial freedom, 
forget the million dollars in financial independence, just get to that next level. And the most important one is level three, which is breathing room. And that's when you have six months of expenses. And it might take you a year or two years to get there. That is an extremely noble goal. Forget about the world telling you you need $5 million to retire. Forget about all that. So, and this is one of my biggest things. This is, drove me crazy is that like the entire personal finance world tells you to budget and cut back on all those small little purchases. But it's those purchases that make up life and give you the most joy. You know, I love that Marie Kondo is like blowing up again because it's like I feel like she and I need to get a room together. And, like, chat <laughs> this. It's like one of my life goals right now. Um, but it's true because those small things like the cup of coffee or the glass of wine or the concert tickets, those are the things that make us happiest. I agree with you. And here we have you. a world telling I, us to cut those I back. I totally agree. I had, I was talking about like marketing my own book and I looked sort of an offhanded way. I said to my editor, I'm like, if you feel like you're counting lattes, you've lost. You've oh, totally. lost. Like yeah. that is the most, the 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 part of me that's like, I'm not, I'm not here to tell you not to have fun. Right. I agree with you. Like figure out what makes you happy. If that latte makes you happy, then maybe something right. else has to give. But like, Go have a latte with your friends. Right, right. Have fun. Right. And he, yeah, exact. Have fun. Enjoy your life. But the thing is, a lot of the money world that I found, and I'm part of the money world now, but I'm operating in my own terms, is, you know, 90 plus percent of it, I think, is scammy, greedy. Money follows money. And so that's the the rapid filled stream that I'm walking up. You know, I went to I was invited to a wealth summit and I just saw recently 3000 people. Um, I was supposed to speak at it and then I declined right before I went on because I saw they were selling these scammy products to people, you know, tax lien software, stuff that like people just starting investing should never buy. And I think that like most of the money world and what people see is that. Mm. And so trying to speak kind of truth within that is where you get the blowback. Mm -hmm. um, even you know, running Facebook ads, for example, for my book, um, continued to get banned, the Facebook ads. And I actually had to have a call with Facebook because like 99% of the people that advertise a money book on Facebook, they're scammy. They're using it for a top of the funnel to sell. And I don't sell a 10,000K package. I don't do money coaching. I'm not an advisor. I have nothing at stake here. You have a book. Share. Exactly. Like a $14 book. I have nothing that I make $2 from. You know what I mean? Like I'm not making any money off of this. I'm just trying to get this to as broad a base of people as possible. But fighting that resistance, fighting money, Money is very powerful because it's 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 profitable to keep people in the dark. And this is one of the things I'd love. To, maybe we should chat about this some other time. I'm researching it now, but I can't prove this yet. But when the United States education system was set up, I believe, and I have some evidence to this, that um, the people who were in the original board of education, um, three of them were part of the you know, largest banks in the country. And financial literacy, financial education was actually proposed as one of those core curriculum topics like history. And they pulled it off the table because yeah. they wanted to keep people in the dark. And it's taken now, you know, over a hundred years uh, for even some states to have, uh, you know, financial education. But even still, a lot of those financial education programs are underwritten by large financial institutions. That you know, it's a it's a tough world, um, and I'm just trying to shine a light and really empower people because you money, all it is, money is a human invention. It didn't exist, you know. 5,000 years. It's just a human invention. And our culture embeds it with so much power and meaning and stress and fear. But you can choose what money means to you. You have that power. You don't have to, you don't have to buy into the fear of how you grew up around it or money's bad or money's good. Like money can be literally whatever you want it to be. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a means to an exchange to get you somewhere, but the emotions you put into it. And that's one of the things I recommend spending five minutes a day with your money. I did it this morning when I had my first cup of coffee. I call it now my money meditation where it's like just spending five minutes a day with your money. It starts to become more familiar to you. And what does that, what does that mean for you when you say spend five minutes with my money? Yeah. So I just open up my mint personal tracking app and just look at my net worth and you know what I spent yesterday and what charges have come in and all my investments and it's just like spending time with a close friend it's like right. spending De and demystifying a topic that for many people is super scary and and breeds anxiety yeah exactly and it's something when you spend five minutes a day with it money starts to be something that's not this abstract stressful thing it's something familiar you know it and then actually I spend the rest of my day spending less because I'm interested in my net worth growing and it's something 
something that is kind of weird for the first 30 days, but after 30 days, you actually get excited to look at your money because you start seeing it go up. You feel more intimate. You feel more close. It feels like a familiar friend. Mm -hmm. And the closer we get with money, the better relationship we end up having with it, then the less emotional we are about investing. So and let me ask you a question. Is your wife as into money as you are? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> uh, she thinks I'm so weird. Uh, she thinks I'm so weird. Um, what is her What is her um, field of study? Uh, she's an anthropologist. Oh, my gosh. Um, so she's, uh, she actually studies you know, social systems and people, and she studies money uh, in, in some capacity. She, she grew up kind of d differently than I did. And, she a rich uh, girl? No, she's not a rich girl. She just grew up differently than I did. Uh, and so um, she also doesn't quite understand the attractiveness of getting out. She's in academia. It's something oh. you know, she's, she's kind of, you know, when you get into academia, if you get the right physician, you kind of, that's like, you kind of win the lottery. And uh, for me, it was like getting to this point of escape. And one of the things it's taken some time to do is I talk very openly about money. Um, I think we, money should be talked about. I think people should share their successes. And, you know, in the book, I have every investment that I made over the five year period, how much I saved, mm. all these things. And that's like, I think being transparent, the more we open up and talk about our struggles and what's happening, the more people are going to learn. Uh, and that's one of the things that, you know, even with my wife, I get resistance around. Do you guys ever fight about money? Um, not really. Um, you know, you have it, which is good. But yeah. usually I feel like people fight a lot more when they don't have it. Yeah, I think the only thing. So we're both frugal. I think that I um, money has diminishing returns for me. So it's one of those things where I have more money than I'll ever need now. And it's something I paradoxically don't even think about that much in terms of my own money. Um, you know, you would think every day I'd be tinkering everything like an investor. But now I just have things all set up. And occasionally, like, I'll spend a Saturday, you know, just like digging in and moving things around and playing with it. But um, it's it's not something but like moving to New York City. I moved here six months ago. And, How's that been? Um, it's great. I found a great apartment. Good deal. I'm probably not going to buy in New York City for a while. I am looking in the Hudson River Valley. But it was one of those situations where it's like, yes, we can afford a, you know, very expensive apartment. But mm -hmm. my whole ethos and mindset and mentality is like I, I value money so much that um, – I, I wouldn't even say I'm frugal. I just value money so much that I, I always try to use it to its best use. I real I rem I know that I've traded my life for that money, mm. and so for me the challenge is actually finding those opportunities and knowing when to, you know, splurge or spend more money uh, because I'm naturally just don't think about it that much. The thing is, the craziest thing about it is like the more money I've had, I realized that just having the ability to buy something is enough. So I'll drop money. Like I went to Seattle a couple of weeks ago, last minute, and I first class round trip ticket. You know, it was like three thousand dollars. And that so was you're something. okay with that? Like oh, if I'm you totally decide okay to do that. it, you do it. Oh yeah, I was tired and I wanted to sleep on the plane mm -hmm. and be refreshed there, so I'd get more time out of it. And like that's something where I just boom drop. Yes. But, you know, I spend less than $300 a year on clothes. And that's that's something my wife gets on me. She's like, why don't you have nicer suits? And why don't you do this? And I'm just like, well, you know, that's just like not who I am. Right. And so there's some challenges uh, there. But I, th I think we've got a good rhythm going. All right. Well, that's good. Now, before I let you go, your best financial decision, which is like it's always sort of mind blowing, was like picking up this book and it changes your life. What was the worst financial decision you've ever made? Craving money above all else. No, that's interesting. I think uh, money became my god during this five-year period. Um, it's something that I... Uh, money can be really addicting. Chasing financial independence can be really addicting. Uh, money addiction has many forms. And I think um, I made a lot of trade-offs that I wouldn't make again. Um, and it's something, yeah, it gets addicting. And I fell into that trap of more, more, more in a way. Luckily, I kind of had an escape hatch in mind. Um, but I think it's always important to realize that life is so much more valuable than money. Time is so much more valuable than money. And that's it was so beautiful writing this book because I was able to reflect back and be like, whoa, you know. Um, what was the best piece of money advice you got as a child? Um, money doesn't grow on trees, I think, uh, you know, it was just the fact that, you know, you have to work for it. I, I always valued money. I, you know, I had like a, you know, a $2 allowance and, you know, these things and I saved and would buy the new video game, you know, so I understood and valued money. Um, but 
yeah, I think the biggest and just the biggest lesson that I learned this entire time was just the correlation between savings rate and years to financial independence. I think it's so interesting is that, you know, all, there's so much to your point about how the the business of of getting people to invest is one thing. And and I don't think that people realize how much better off you are just by saving. I mean, forgetting about whether you have ABC mutual fund or XYZ mutual fund. Saving is your salvation. That is what will get you to the next place, wherever that place, whatever you define that goal to be. Right. If you save, you will get there faster. My fear is that people sometimes will say to me like, well, I don't have enough money, so I just want to like, you know, basically put all my money on number eight black mm -hmm. and hope that comes in. Right. I'm like, dude, just save. Yeah. You'll just, get there. But saving is kind of perceived as boring. I and like boring. And, but once again, it's like, look at how the personal finance world sells it. There's with budgeting, save, cut back. There's this whole scarcity mindset where saving, it's really an opportunity. Yeah, buying so yourself how, but, but options. How, but gen, like genetically, biologically, we're not designed to save. We're not designed. Our minds literally can't comprehend seven figure numbers. You know, there's some of these things that like our minds can't get. And saving for the future is not something we're wired to do. And so you have to kind of rewire yourself a little bit and also set up automated systems. You know, we've talked about a little bit about that. Uh, so you don't have to think about it as much. But it's one of those things where anything in life, you just need to get a little bit of momentum. And this is why I recommend the correlation between savings rate and years to retirement, the average American saves 3.2% of their income. If they can just get to 10%, you know, you've cut 15 years off to retirement. You've gone from never to actually making it possible. And people are like, how does that happen? Just save 1% every 30 days and you're never going to feel it. You know what's amazing to me? Like when I think about it, it's probably your grandparents, but my parents, it, it's like they used to have rules of thumb. Save a dime for every right. dollar you make. Right. And guess what? As it turns out, that was really good advice. That's not enough. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a start. But it's like you start right. with like instilling that notion. Right. Um, and they were fighting fewer forces. I mean, yeah. We didn't have credit cards till the fifties. We didn't have online one-click ordering, you know, until like fifteen years ago. And so it's never been easier to make money. It's also never been easier to spend it. And so our grandparents had it easy in that sense. Yeah. Um, so, but Those yeah, lucky bastards. <laughs> <laughs> the depression and all big deal. No, no, but they, uh, I think they also have had different values. As I think well. they had different values. I think that there were simpler times in many ways. And I think that um, what you are advocating here is so laudable. I am so happy that we got you in the studio. It's very you. exciting. Grant Sabatier. Yep. That's it, right? That's it. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining yeah, us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jill. I it appreciate great. it. Thanks so much to Grant Sabatier. That book is called Financial Freedom. If you've got a financial question, if you want to learn how to gain that financial independence, why don't you shoot us an email? It's so easy. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We drop new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer, and we're distributed by Cadence 13. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.